So that's where my mechanic is. And then, uh, it's looking about 1700 bucks to fix it. That's cheap for my car. This is not the turbo. All right. So just a quick announcement before uh, we get started. Unfortunately, I've got to cancel office hours again today, and I warned you on Piazza that there was a good chance of this. Uh, yeah, I am still sick, and unfortunately, it is rather contagious, so should keep a distance. Uh, it's mostly for your safety. Um, yes, I've been to a doctor. Yes, it is getting corrected, but uh, in the meantime, I will be on Piazza if you need any help with the assignment, of course, and uh, we'll go from there. All right, now don't forget as well that you have a quiz on Friday. And uh, the quiz on Friday is going to be about the scheduling. So, short section. All right, so our operating system of the day uh, is called Minix. And this was released in 87, and it was created by a guy named Andrew Tenenbaum. And if you've looked around at any operating systems textbooks, you might actually recognize this name, because he's the author of one of them. In fact, he's the author of one of the most famous ones. Um, not ours, not our author. Uh, although the textbook manufacturers like to send me samples, and they sent me this one. It's a great big, nice big one. They do this, like I keep getting these OS textbooks in the mail. And they're like, yes, look, a free gift of an OS textbook. They do this for a reason, right? They want you to switch to using their textbook so they can get the money off of it. But it's like, I like free. I'm not changing anything, but thanks for the book. Makes good paper, right? No, it's a good book. Uh, all right, so Minix. Uh, it's supposed to stand for Mini Unix, and what's interesting about Minix is it is not a monolithic kernel. So it is not like Unix, it is not like Linux, it is a microkernel, which means they put the bare minimum of functionality into the operating system as possible. Um, it was originally only 12,000 lines of code. I would like to point out that is smaller than OS 161. OS 161 is something like 21 or 22,000. This is smaller originally. And it was written in C, and it that 12,000 lines was for the kernel, file system, and memory manager. Now something that was kind of neat about Minix is that it's called a self-healing operating system. So the idea was that if some device driver crashed, and I'm sure many of you have had this happen. You're playing some video game and your NVIDIA device driver crashes. Well, what would normally happen is your program would die and your operating system, especially if you're running Windows, is going to blue screen and death and die as well. Minix said, we want to be self-healing. So instead of the process that was running terminating and the OS panicking and dying, it has the ability to restart the device driver without stopping anything. So you're playing your game, NVIDIA driver crashes, your game temporarily pauses, the driver gets reset, and your game goes back to playing as if nothing happened. Now, I don't know how successful this was, because Minix is not an operating system that has been tried and tested by millions of people. Uh, but it did work for the use case that it had. Hey, that gives us some reliability, right? <coughs> Which is nice. Uh, now, what's interesting about Minix is this was actually Linus Torvald's inspiration for Linux. Um, now, there was a lawsuit that's been out there that said Linus copied Minix's source code, but those allegations have been uh, proven false. Uh, there, th while there are similarities between the two, they don't actually share a code base. If you think about it, you're looking at two fundamental different kinds of OS. One is a microkernel, one is a monolithic kernel. There's some pretty big differences between that, those two kinds of design. All right. Yes, that means we're going to get to Linux soon. 
Not next, not Tuesday, and I don't think Wednesday, but I think the following week, maybe. Still a ways off. All right. So where did we leave off? There we go. So we left off last class looking at our good old friend, the hard drive. And uh, I hope I've terrified you all into understanding that those lovely little hard drives that you buy are exceptionally fragile. Please take good care of that. Uh, just to re recap, remember that inside of a hard drive, should you open it up, you will find a number of platters which are made of ceramic or glass or porcelain. And they are covered in a ferromagnetic material which we are using uh, to actually store the binary information. We organize the data on the disk as follows. We have rings, which are called tracks. And if you take the same track for each platter, we call that a cylinder. That's some terminology you may see if you look at some of our older notes, it's a cylinder. And then each track is divided into a number of sectors. You can think of it as a slice of pizza is the sector. Now, even though when you look at this, you might think to yourself, well, it, in order for all of the sectors to have the same size, they would have to actually you know, occupy the same amount of space on the disk, which means that each track should probably have a different number of tracks, or different number of sectors. Yeah, but that's not how we're going to do it. We are going to say the following. Every track has the same capacity. Every sector has the same capacity, and every track has the same number of sectors, because that's going to make the math nice. <coughs> now, <coughs> whether that is how they are actually laid out on the physical disk, we're not going to worry about it. This is an approximation. What we need to do then, in order to find a piece of data on one of these disks, is we need to engage two separate motors. The first motor that we need to engage is the one for the read-write head. We need to move the arm so that the read-write head is sitting over the correct track. That is called seek. We are seeking the correct track. The second thing that we need to do is we need to rotate the platter such that the correct sector is underneath that read-write head. Now, I've kind of made you believe that the motors are initially off, and when we want to do a read or write operation, we have to turn them on. That is true for seek, but that is not true for rotating to the correct sector. As it turns out, your disk is always spinning, and it's always spinning because the cost to spin up and spin down is too great. However, if you have one of those environmentally friendly disks, WD greens or what have you, be warned, they do spin down. And because they spin down and go into this sleep state, there's a variety of different sleep states that they actually have, if you suddenly try to use them again, they not only have to wake up, but they have to spin back up again, and that takes a little extra time. So from a performance perspective, those uh, environmentally friendly ones aren't as fast because they are actually stopping the spinning. Um, otherwise, most other disks spin all the time unless you put your computer to sleep or in some kind of hibernate state. All right. So if we were to then calculate the cost of doing a read or write on a disk, you can actually do that. Um, and uh, we call this the cost to service an I.O. request. So I have some I.O. request. We are going to assume that the cost of reading and the cost of writing is exactly the same. Because within a margin of error, it is for this. So then the cost to do that I.O. job is going to be the cost to move our rewrite head to the correct track, plus the cost to get the platter to the correct sector, plus the cost to actually do the read or write. Now, when the read write head is over top of the sector, it can't read the whole sector at once. It can only read one bit at a time. 
So we actually, as if we are the needle, that is the read-write head, if we are reading a sector, we actually have to rotate the platter underneath the needle in order to read all of the data that's contained in that sector. So we have the seek time. That is the time to move the read-write head to the correct track. Now, the amount of time it takes to do this depends on the current position of the read-write head. The maximum seek time is the time it takes to move from the innermost track to the outermost track on the disk, because that is the maximum seek distance. The minimum, of course, is zero. You are already on the correct track. Now, sometimes in a formula, we may say, oh, we are on track 500, and I need to move to track 540, and there are 1,000 total tracks. You should be able to calculate the amount of time it takes to move one track and then figure out how many you did move and do some multiplication and get the answer from that. But most of the time, we don't tell you what track you are on. And we don't tell you what track you are going to. And in those such cases, what we want you to compute is known as the average seek time. The average seek time is the maximum seek time divided by two. And we used to, you know, have all this expected value calculations, you know, back when I took this course. Nah, just take it for our word, okay? You can just use that formula straight up. No, no explanation, no justification. All right. So then we have the rotational latency. Now, the disk is always spinning, but that's the problem. So as you're moving your read-write head into the correct position, the disk is always spinning. We don't stop the disk when we get to the correct sector, which means that the correct sector may go underneath the read-write head as we are moving the read-write head into position. So the rotational latency is once the head is in the read-write position, how long is it going to take for that sector to go rotate back under and be aligned again? So rotational latency, the maximum is going to be the cost it takes to rotate the platter 360 degrees, so exactly around one. Minimum is zero, because by fluke we are in exactly the position that we want. Uh, we can usually, again, this is one of those situations where you can calculate the exact time it's going to take if you know where you are right now and where you need to be in the future. You can calculate you know, the cost to move each individual sector, and then from there you can figure out, oh, look, I moved, multiply that by the cost of moving one sector. Now, we don't usually tell you where you are right now because we don't usually know. So oftentimes, instead of using just the actual rotational latency, we use an average rotational latency. And again, formula, you can take it as it is, maximum rotational latency divided by two. If you're one of those people who really likes math and expected values, by all means, I'm sure you can dig up the paper where they explain why this works. But we're not going to expect you to do that. All right, the last cost is the transfer time. That is the cost to rotate the sector or sectors you are reading underneath the read-write head. So if I am moving, at minimum, I am reading one sector. And so at minimum, the, cost, the transfer time is going to be the cost to rotate through one sector. Now how do you figure that out? Well, you take the maximum rotational latency, and you divide it by the number of sectors there are, and that tells you the cost to rotate through one sector. And then if you're rotating through 10 sectors, then you multiply that number by 10. So it's fairly straightforward math. All right. Any questions about this? Yeah? Is it possible for the um, disk to rotate too quickly so the head can't read it? No. <laughs> no, these, these disks would have been put together in such a way that uh, that won't happen. Now, you might have noticed that I said the minimum transfer time is one sector. And here's a magical truth about disks. Disks do not do bit-based addressing, nor do they do byte-based addressing. The minimum denomination on a disk is a sector. You can read a whole sector or you can write a whole sector. You cannot read part of a sector. You cannot write part of a sector. So disks do sector-based addressing. 
So keep that in mind. Yes, that means if you need to write exactly one byte to disk, then we have to read the whole sector in RAM, make the change in RAM, and write the whole sector back to disk. The disks do not generally support anything at denominations less than a sector, which is why we say the minimum transfer time is going to be at least one sector. All right. To get the final I.O. service request time, we sum these three values up. So it is the seek time plus the rotational latency plus the transfer time. And now we know exactly how long our uh, operation is going to take. Now you might be wondering, well, where do I get the maximum seek time or the maximum rotational latency from? You get those from the disk manufacturer. So if you go into Canada Computers today, they have you know, 100 different disks that you can choose from. Uh, they've got Seagates and they've got Western Digitals. Do they still make Baxter? I don't think so. I haven't seen those in a while. And I know they don't make quantum fireballs anymore. Thank God. Those were awful. Uh, you've got lots of disk choices. And if you actually look at the fine print on the disks, you will actually see all of the values that you need in order to do these calculations. They usually will tell you either the average seek or the maximum seek time. And they always tell you the speed. So 10,000 RPM, well, that's how many times I can spin the disk around in one minute. 10,000 revolutions in one minute. Which means, from there, you should be able to figure out how long it takes to do a single rotation. A single rotation is the maximum rotational latency. So all of that is provided by the disk manufacturer. All right. So. A bunch of formulas and a little example. Uh, now, there's a bit of a typo on this. So uh, we have a disk, and the disk capacity is 2 to the power of 32 bytes. And uh, we have one platter, one single-sided platter. Now, that's something to keep in mind. Disks can have multiple platters, and the platters can be double-sided. Make sure you're paying attention to that when you're doing uh, cost equations for this. The other thing we have is there are 2 to the power of 20 tracks, and then each track has 2 to the power of 8 sectors. We've given you the speed in revolutions per minute and the maximum seek time of 20 milliseconds. And then what we're asking you to do is to calculate the number, the capacity of the track, uh, the number of bytes in the sector, uh, the maximum rotational latency, the average seek time, and the average rotational latency. And then in number five, we want you to calculate the cost to transfer one sector. What I'm asking you there is not the total I.O. service request time for one sector. We're asking you, what is the transfer time for one sector? And then the final one is the expected cost to reach 10 consecutive sectors. That is not the transfer time for 10 sectors. That's the total time to read 10 consecutive sectors. So take a few minutes. We've got the formulas here. See if you can work these out, and then we'll take a look at the answer. <laughs> Conveniently, so is the platter. You can read them all in one shot. <laughs> because when you're done reading the first sector, you're already in the correct position for the next one. So you can just keep reading.
sure that gets posted to Piazza so that you've got some more practice with this. Um, but we take the capacity of the disk, we divide it by the number of tracks, and that's going to give us the capacity of the track, which is 2 to the 12. And then we take the capacity of the track and divide it by the number of sectors to get the capacity of the sector. And then we find the maximum rotational latency is 6 milliseconds. And from there, we get the average rotational latency as 3 milliseconds. Hey, it's not bad. Okay. Uh, our seek time, on the other hand, because it's 20 milliseconds, our average is 10. And then our cost to transfer one sector. So our one sector cost is going to be, you notice I've taken the maximum rotational latency and divided it by the number of sectors. So that's going to tell me the cost to transfer one sector, or rotate the platter through one sector. Make sure in number five that when you're using a rotational latency, you're using the maximum and not the average. Otherwise, you're going to have a really bad time. You'll get something that's a lot faster than it should be. And then in order to compute the cost of an IR request for 10 consecutive sectors, well, since they're consecutive, this, the read write head's already in the correct position, and they're right in a row, so there's no rotational latency for the subsequent sector reads. So you do one seek, one rotational latency, plus 10 times the cost to, ro to uh, transfer the data, uh, a sector. So you end up with something like 13.195 milliseconds. Now, I know that on an exam you get no calculator. And yes, these are our favorite kinds of questions to show up on the final, because the final is always much more heavily weighted to post midterm content. Um, so we understand this. You get no calculator. Feel free to leave things in fractions, simplified. But do make certain that you've made your units very clear to everybody, OK? All right, any questions about these? Yep. What do you mean, like, if we were... If I wanted to read an entire track, it would have to be the end of the point, or I just start reading? 
Um, so it depends on how the file has been laid out. So if we assume that the file has been laid out consecutively um, and it occupies the entire track, then that probably means you're going to start at the first sector. Because you're going to want to read the file in order. Um, but that's maybe a lot of assumptions. When we talk about the actual file systems, we see how these two things are actually kind of related to each other. All right. Any other questions? All right. So as it turns out, if you're looking at one of these mechanical disks, um, if you are trying to read data from this disk, it should be fairly obvious, hopefully, from the equations we've just shown you, that doing a large sequential read is much faster than doing a number of short reads. So for example, if my file was stored on the disk in one contiguous 10 gigabyte block, and let's say that was an entire track, that is much faster to read than if my file, my 10 gigabyte file, was split into 10 pieces and scattered across the disk randomly. Random I.O. is much more expensive, costly per byte, than sequential I.O. Now, the rotational latency we can't do anything about because the disk is always spinning. And also, if you look at it, in the grand scheme of things, the rotational latency we're getting better and better and better at. But something that is still lagging behind in terms of cost is the seek time. Seek time, we have to start the motor up, it has to engage, it has to move, and then it takes time. And so when we're talking about disks and talking about improving the performance with respect to disk I.O., we're usually referring to improving seek time on average. And it is certainly true for sequential I.O. versus random I.O. that the seek time is minimized for sequential I.O. Now you might then ask yourself, well, why don't I do everything as sequential I.O. on my disk? Yeah, there is a reason we don't do that. Because if I store my files as big sequential blocks of things, then I'm going to have a fragmentation problem where I can't actually find any space to store a file because I have no contiguous block available. So in order to actually you know, use our space of our disk properly, we actually fragment files, which means in reality, even though we know sequential I.O. is cheaper and on average, random I.O. is much more likely. When I was a kid, by the way, and uh, we had disk drives, my first disk drive was only five megabytes. Yeah, I know. It was about this big, and it was about that thick, and it probably weighed 20 pounds. It's pretty awesome. Uh, but when you had those really small hard drives, the fragmentation problem was actually so bad, it impacted your performance so much that you had to run a defrag program on the disk almost every day in order to get optimal performance out of your stuff. But we'll talk about the fragmentation details when we talk about uh, file systems. Yeah? So if the disk has multiple platters, the cost model is actually still the same. Um, it's going, except now we have to look at uh, the capacity of a track um, with respect to how many total tracks are there in the system. Because now you have multiple platters, so there's, even though each platter has the same number of tracks, the total number of tracks is different. Now, I know there might be this temptation if there's multiple platters and each one has a read-write arm, can't we do reading and writing it on all the platters at the same time? And the answer to that is no. Um, I'm not saying from a hardware perspective that's not possible. I'm saying that is not how it's currently done. The read-write heads for all platters move at the same time. So they are not individually articulated. So you can only read from one. It's not to say you couldn't do it otherwise, but do you really want to put that much more fragile mechanics inside something that's already made out of glass? Probably not. Expensive. All right, so looking at, just if you're curious, what are some good seek times? So traditionally, um, disks today, it's common to see a seek time of between nine and 12 milliseconds. 
And if you're buying a high end commercial drive, they have seek times as low as three and four milliseconds. So the more money you pay, the cheaper it's going to be. But the costs go up in a very much non-linear fashion. All right, so let's assume that seek time is expensive because seek time is expensive. And we also know that random IO is just a fact of life. So since we know those two things, is there anything that we can do to maybe on average reduce the amount of seek time? And we can. We can schedule IO jobs just like we can schedule anything else. So what's going to happen, and I know it's very small on this slide here, it's a little bit bigger on some of the others, is we are going to have a job queue. And the truth is, jobs are arriving at the disk at a rate much faster than it's actually capable of servicing them. Remember how we talked about on-demand paging? It uses your disk. And as you can imagine, as we are trying to like watch a movie, we are only loading the parts of the movie that are actually playing right now. And so we are going to be constantly doing disk reads and disk writes. And again, when we talk about file systems, you'll see just how ridiculous the number of disk reads and writes actually is. So there's way more reads and writes happening than we can service at any one time. So we have a queue. And in that queue, the operating system actually knows to which track each of those jobs actually belongs to. So we can use that information to schedule the jobs to try to minimize the total amount of travel we're actually putting on the read-write head. So in our first example, we have our jobs, and it's the same for all of these examples. And uh, what we're going to do is the black square is the current position of the read-write head. These concentric rings, of course, are the tracks. And then each of the colored dots is the position, at least from a track perspective, of where the job is. So our order is 104, 183, 37, 122, 14, 130, 65, 7. So that's our order that they arrived in. So obviously, the first thing that we could do to schedule these jobs is just first in, first out, right? It's the easiest solution. And if we do that, look at all the movement our head is going to do. I'm going to go from here all the way over to this side of the disk, and now I've got to go all the way back to service this one, and then maybe a little further over here. It doesn't minimize anything. There is one really good thing that it does do, though. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> ah, close your Not better yet. All right. So there's one really good thing that FIFO gives us. No starvation. Every job that shows up will be serviced, will be serviced in order, even if it has to wait. <coughs> so that's good. Here's another algorithm. This is called shortest seek time first. What we do with shortest seek times first is that we have the current position of the head and we say, okay, which jaw in Q is closest to me? That's the one I'm going to start first. And so instead of going and doing 104 first, I'm going to see, oh, I'm roughly at about position 53 or so. So let's service, oh, uh, 65 is the closest. So I service 65. Once I get to 65, I see that 70 is closest. So then I do 70. And then 37. And then 14. And then 104, and then 122, 130, 183. We are effectively minimizing the distance that we are traveling. But here's the problem. Jobs are constantly arriving. And there is a good probability that the jobs are arriving in the same rough position on the disk. So maybe you've got one job that's all the way over on track 200, but all of the jobs that are arriving and your head is around track 50. The job 200 may never get serviced, which means that program you opened appears to have frozen. It hasn't frozen in the sense that bad things haven't happened, 
but it's frozen in the sense that it just hasn't been scheduled time to actually get the data it needs off of this. So with this particular method, starvation is a problem, and that's not something we want to deal with when we're loading data from a disk, especially combined with something like on-demand paging. What if that's your OS? <coughs> All right. So we're not going to use FIFO and we're not going to use shortest uh, seek distance first. What we do use is something called the elevator algorithm, which is more commonly known as SCAN, and there's many variants of it. And this is the idea. I have all of my jobs in front of me, and I can say, okay, this is where I am right now. I'm going to choose a direction to go. I'm going to go this way. And when I go this way, as I walk this direction, I am going to service every job I see as I travel in this direction. So in this case, they started out at 53, and they went to 65, and then they went to 70, and they kept going, servicing every job they see until they get to the end. And when they get to the end, there are no more jobs in front of them, so they turn around and they go back. And they service every job they see going in this direction. And when they get to the end, they turn around and they go back the other way. Now, it does give us a much more reduced seek time than 5 volt on average. There's also no starvation. Because I know that a job that arrived immediately after I left that position it's going to get serviced very shortly because I'm going to reach the edge of the disk, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to go back and I will see it on my way back. So we're getting reduced seek time on average and we're also not having any starvation. And hey, isn't this actually kind of easy to implement? It's not that bad at all. Now something a lot of people like to ask is where does this scheduling actually happen? And that's actually a bit of a complicated answer. So this scheduling can actually be done in the kernel of the operating system because obviously every disk read and write is going to go through the OS. This can also be done on the disk. Every single device has a little bit of processing power and the disk controller can actually queue and schedule jobs on its own. It can also be done by both. So the kernel could be the only one, the device could be the only one, or both could do it. So there's a lot of variation going on there. Yep. What does it look like when they're both doing it? Um, so if they're both doing it, there's the potential that the kernel isn't actually aware that the device is doing it. Um, so the kernel is just going to schedule the jobs, send them off to the device at whatever rate the device wants, and then the device has its own pool and does its own scheduling internally. The kernel operating system doesn't always know everything that the devices are actually doing. Nor does it need to, in a lot of cases. All right. Any questions about that? All right. Well then, let's make a device driver for our disk, right? We need one. So if we look at OS 161's uh, disk, there are five device registers. Uh, we have status register, which is the number of sectors on the disk. We also have a status and command register called status. Yes, I know these are badly named. Still not as bad as calling stuff AS activate when it doesn't activate anything. Uh, all right, let me bring up my notes here because I don't remember all the details about each of these. Okay. So, we have um, the status one. Now, what's interesting about this is if you read status, it's going to tell you whether a read or write is in progress. And if you write status, you're going to tell the disk whether you want to read or write from the disk. It can also be used to convey error messages back to you. Then we have the command register sector number. So what you're going to do is first you're going to write, um, if you write the sector number, that's telling the disk which sector you want to read or write from. And it's used in conjunction with that status command register together 
they will tell this exactly what we need to do. The last one that we have is uh, we have a status register for rotational speed, which isn't particularly useful unless you want to you know, estimate transfer time. And then we have the data, which is the transfer buffer that is 512 bytes in size. It is the exact size of one disk sector because we cannot do a partial sector write or a partial sector read. We can only read or write a whole sector. And so our transfer buffer is exactly one sector in size. And when we are doing a read or write, we tell it exactly which sector we are reading or writing. Not the address within the sector, the sector number. Because that's all that we can do. What well, the offset? The offset value, that is just where um, OS161 puts that device register in the memory slot. It's kind of arbitrary. I wouldn't have put it there. Status registers are not written. Status registers are, if it's a pure status register, it would be just read. So that's not a register we would write to. That would be just a register we read to, from. All right. So we need to write a driver to handle reads and writes on this disk. Now, here is the truth. You can only do one read or one write on a disk at a time, even if it has multiple platters. The arms do not move independently of each other. One read or one write at a time. This is not quantum computing where you can be two places at once. Even though I know, yes, until we actually observe you, you are everywhere at once. Well, I'm observing you, which means you are here. Right. Let's not go into quantum. All right. We can only be one place at a time. So only one read or write at a time, which means my device, my disk, needs a binary semaphore to protect it from multiple operations happening at the same time. So we have a disk semaphore. So we are doing the write handler here. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to copy the data from RAM into the device's data transfer buffer. Yes, that means I'm copying data from one location in RAM to another. I'm aware. Uh, remember that OS161 uses memory map I/O. The next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to write the target sector number into the sector register. And the third thing I do is into the status register, I do write the write command. And now, the disk does the write. Now, as you know, that means the disk has to do all of that motor engagement. It's got to move to the correct position and then do the right. So it's going to take some time. The calling thread cannot return to its program until the write's done. Right? You shouldn't like issue a write, and before that write is going to be completed, issue another write. We want the calling program to have to wait for this job to actually complete before we return to it. So we want to put the caller to sleep. So, and to wait for the disk to complete before we return. So what we're going to do is we have a second sum for called the disk completion sum for, and its initial value is zero. And we are going to pee it. And that is going to cause us, the caller, to go to sleep. Now, the disk goes its job. The CPU goes doing something else, and the disk completes its job, so it fires an interrupt. Then what we're going to do is we act completion back to the device. We're going to reset that status register, clear it out, and then we V the disk completion sum for, which breaks us back up. Now, the other reason why we want to return to the caller before we return from the right is there's the potential that there's some errors that need to be handled. And who better to handle the errors than the thread that actually instantiated the write in the first place? Seriously? You want to know what it is? It's, um, there's this spammer out here from like, the Justice Department, and I swear they call like a detective. I haven't done anything illegal. Also, the message isn't entirely in English. <laughs> All right, so this is the right handler. Let's look at the read now. So here we have reads. 
So again, only one read or write at a time, so we have to pee that disc sum core again. So we pee the disc sum core. And uh, this time, we are going, you notice we don't write anything to the data transfer buffer? Well, that's because we are trying to get data from the disk, not put it onto the disk. So we're going to put the target sector in, and then we're going to put read into the status register, and then the write and read is going to happen. Now, our program, again, can't continue until the read is complete, because presumably you read something and you wanted to read something into your address space so you could use it. So you better wait. So, second time report puts us to sleep. The other thread picks up on the interrupt. We add conclusion to the device. We wake back up from the V. And now, what's interesting is there is something we need to do when we wake back up. Our transfer buffer, which is located in that memory slot, case at one, our device register, has the sector of data in it that we asked for. I need to take that data and copy it into my address space before I let go of my hold on the disk so that nobody corrupts the data I just read. So when we wake back up, we're going to grab the data from the device register, put it into the address space, handle any errors, and then we are finally done with the disk so we release our hold on it, and we're done. And that is how we actually write the device driver for this the disk. Now, You'll notice that both of these device drivers actually used two semaphores instead of one, like our clock or our serial console. You don't always need two semaphores. You need two semaphores if it is imperative that the thread that instantiated the contact with the device has to wait for the device to complete before it can continue. Then you would need a second semaphore to force it to go to sleep. You also need a second semaphore if it is critical that the instantiating thread is the one that handles errors or some other extra work once the device is done. If those conditions are not true, then you do not need the second semaphore. But for obviously a disk, it is needed because you can't start using the data before you've actually read it from the disk. All right. Any questions about this? Yep? What's stopping the disk from having multiple arms and getting rewrite to the other So the disk technically, so it has one arm with multiple rewrite heads, but the, right now they all move at the same time. And it can only, obviously, you're not reading from the same position. You wouldn't be doing write from the same position on each of the platters at the same time. Um, is there a reason why we can't have them each individually articulated? But you could totally build that hardware. It would be more money. It would require um, more logic to the controller to actually manage the fact that now each arm moves independently, which means you would also need extra logic to handle multiple reads and writes happening at the same time, which means you also probably need multiple caches, your driver is going to be significantly more complicated. It's not that it can't be done. The reason now why it's not done right now is because of the added costs associated with actually managing it. It's just cheaper to do it otherwise. And then you have to say, is the added cost worth the benefit? So, not to say that there's no disk out there that doesn't do it. You're saying for the most part. All right, so any other questions? Yep? Uh, does the disk completion somehow start with zero? Yes, this completion is always starting with zero. That way, when we pee it, we know we're going to fall asleep. Okay, and the disk somehow start with one? Yes, yes, this is the binary semaphore. Okay. And again, this is this is one of the tricks when you're using semaphores, is you need to make sure you use it properly, because it doesn't check. So if you're using a binary semaphore, you need to make sure you use it properly, or you're going to have a bad time. All right. Well, that's nice and all. How many of you actually have a mechanical for hard drive? Not that many. You know, when I started teaching this course, I think it was about half the class. I have them, by the way. I have 12? I don't know, it's something like 60-some terabytes of them. A lot. I just bought a bunch of 14 terabyte ones, so. 
I ran out of space. All right. So most of you don't have these. Most of you have solid state drives, or SSDs as they're known, or some kind of flash-based storage thing. So whether that is, my mom calls them zip sticks, what she means is USB attached storage. And if you're wondering why does my mom call them a zip stick, uh, actually there's a reason for that. In the 90s, um, people used floppy drives, three and a half inch floppy drives, and they only had, I think, a capacity of about 1.44 megs. And then somebody came up with this new kind of disc called a zip disc. And I don't remember quite how much data, I think it was over 100 megs or something. We never had one, but my mom heard about them and she thought they were awesome. And now, I don't know, now she confuses them with USB drives. Anyways. Whether you have an SSD or you're using some kind of USB attached storage device, you are using uh, some, a form of persistent storage that has no moving parts at all. Solid state drives have no moving parts. They are a bunch of chips on a board. It is boring. If you open it up, you probably won't hurt anything, unlike a mechanical hard drive, where if you open that up, it probably will never work properly ever again. Please don't do it. I am not liable for you opening those. So an SSD is just a boring old circuit board with a bunch of chips on it. That is your memory. Now, this has actually been around for a really, really long time. Um, and there have been many, many different forms of solid state storage. One of the oldest, coolest forms of storage like this was um, this thing called magnetic core memory. It is really, really, really cool. It looks like your grandmother knitted a sweater out of copper wire, and at every intersection they put a little uh, cylindrical magnet. And they'd be these great big cores. And I wish I had one to show you, but it's $1,000 if I import it off eBay from Russia, and I don't know, that just doesn't sound like a good idea. Also because eBay is generally not a good idea. Uh, I still want one though, because they're awesome looking. But this idea of solid state storage, of storage that has no moving parts, has actually been around for a really long time. Um, now, of the more recent versions of this, there have been two major implementations. Um, there are lots of implementations, but the two big ones are DRAM and flash memory. Now, DRAM you may not have heard of. Um, so here's the thing. RAM that is in your computer cannot be used for persistent storage because when it loses power, all of the data that is stored there <coughs> disappears. It's gone. DRAM is power RAM. What they do is in amongst the transistors of memory, they actually have these little things called capacitors. You can think of capacitors as like a little tiny battery that can hold a very tiny charge for a very short period of time. So the idea with DRAM is in with the transistors, they have all of these capacitors, and the capacitors are used to maintain power, to maintain the power in the transistors. Now obviously, since they can only hold the charge for a very short period of time, they have to be periodically refreshed by some other power source. And for DRAM, that's either it's in a machine and it's plugged in, so it's getting power from the main supply, or if it's not turned on, it has an internal battery, like a little watch battery, that is actually used to refresh those capacitors. Now, obviously that poses a problem. <laughs> because what happens if the battery dies? Or what happens if you decide to change the battery? So it's, it has been used, but it's not exactly the most user-friendly version. What we tend to use today is flash memory. I am not an electrical engineer. So when I say it traps electrons in a quantum cage, do I know what that means? Um, no, I don't. <laughs> but let's just say it has a mechanism for trapping the, in, the um, energy it needs in order to keep the data. Now, it is also true that if your SSD is not plugged into a power source for something like, I think it's at least 10 years, it could be a lot longer than that, that it will lose data. So it has to be plugged in at least once every you know, decade or so in order to maintain that, because it will lose its charge eventually. 
But if you have an SSD for 10 years, wow. Okay, to be fair, I, I, I had a computer that lasted me 10 years. It was a record scheme. I just got rid of it, actually. So like my, my Game Boy games, when it says internal battery run dry, so they're using DRAM? Ooh, so I don't, so that battery is being used to, for the save state. Yeah. So it's not that your game won't work, because your game itself will be actually like a, a, a ROM. Yeah. But the save, the ability to save will be the problem there. I don't know if they're using DRAM or, I don't think it's flash. I'm not sure exactly what they're doing, but yes, if the battery in your Game Boy cartridge goes bad, you won't be able to save, but still be able to play the game. Yeah. Of course, if it's something like Mega Man, then yeah, you're screwed, right? All right, did they even let you save? Okay, so flash memory is mostly what we use today. It's also known as NAND flash memory because it's made up of NAND gates. Fun story. Uh, another fun thing about uh, flash memory. So you go to Canada Computers and you're like, I want a 64 gigabyte key. It's Black Friday, look, they're two bucks. That's how I ended up with mine. Um, it was an impulse purchase. I was buying a Nintendo, and I, at, at the gate there at the, on Black Friday, it was like $2.64 gig keys, and I was like, ooh, I don't know what I need this for, but two bucks, I'll buy it. So you show up at Canada Computers and you're like, yeah, I want a 64 gig key, and it's two bucks. Well, here's a dirty secret in the hardware world. Um, that 64 gig, gig key was probably a 128 gigabyte key, where a certain percentage of the memory cells didn't work. Do you honestly think they make that many unique versions of things? And if you buy your NVIDIA GTX 1080, or maybe you did buy the 1080, maybe you got the 1060, it's probably a 1080 with one pin soldered over. Now, we actually found this out with Intel's Eon chips once. Um, there were different you know, designations of them. And the high end, I mean, nobody wanted to pay for the high end one because we found that the one underneath, which was less than half the cost, if we just soldered two pins, it was actually the high end one. <laughs> so there's a dirty secret, but this is especially true with flash memory. Is it's often just a higher capacity one where a certain percentage of the cells didn't work. Dirty secrets of the hardware world. I'm not making it up. I've heard this straight from the source, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So how is it that they are able to keep like all their 64 gigabytes sits at around 64 gigabyte device? Oh, in the um, the controller. Oh, they. <laughs> They, they can put an artificial limit inside the controller that says, oh, yes, I'm aware I technically have 115, but I'm selling this as a 64. That's totally right. That's a controller. And that's how we discover a lot of this stuff, is by tinkering with it. Right. Wait a minute, that, that Xeon chip, that's actually the high-end one with this pin. Oh, sorry. People with too much time on their hands. All right. So flash memory is the interesting one that we want to talk about. Now, what's interesting is when we're trying to look at flash memory, we're not, <coughs> or SSDs, we're not talking about tracks and sectors anymore because tracks and sectors were a physical thing. There's no more physical thing. There's no more big, pretty, shiny circle. It's just a bunch of ugly chips. And so, but we still want to divide up the memory. So instead of having an actual physical division, now we have more of a logical division. So we've logically divided the SSD into pages and blocks. So pages are typically 2, 4, or 8 kilobytes in size. Obviously, 4 kilobytes is going to be the most common designation uh, for page size because that is the size we use for virtual memory. And on-demand paging, it would be really nice if the page size on my disk That's the page size in my RAM because then I only have to do one I.O. operation to get a page. Uh, now, each of those pages uh, are combined together and created into block, uh, logically separated into blocks. Uh, block size is increasing, so these numbers are probably a little bit out of date. Um, all right. <clears throat> there are quirks. So first off, on an SSD, whereas we think of zero as being unwritten, on an SSD, 
one is unwritten. And the reason why it is one and not zero is because in order to go from a zero to a one, a lot, a, a much higher voltage needs to be applied. Whereas to go from a one to a zero, you don't need to apply as much voltage. So they select one be the empty state. Now, there's a little bit more detail. So technically speaking, we can do reads and writes at a page level. But when it comes to writes, it's a little bit complicated. If the page has never been written to before, and that is, is all ones, then we can write to the page at a page level. But if the page has already been written to, then we would be overwriting or deleting a page, and we cannot do that at a page level. We cannot apply a high voltage at a page level. We can only apply a high voltage at a block level. So that's going to cause some very interesting behaviors to go down on your SSD. So let's suppose <coughs> that uh, you downloaded something and it wasn't what you thought it was. And um, so now you want to delete it. You actually want to free up the memory. So I want to delete or overwrite some cells on my disk. The naive solution to this is you're going to, so you have a page in a block that you want to delete or overwrite. The naive solution is to copy the entire block into RAM, make the change to the block in RAM, and then write the entire block back to the SSD. Now you will note that uh, in between copying it to RAM and writing it back to disk, we reset the block to ones. Uh, that's important because your SSD does not like actually overwriting data with other data. It's much easier for the SSD if it resets the entire block to ones and then you write a fresh copy on top of it. That is the naive solution and it works technically. But your SSD is smarter than that. Your SSD has realized, well of course it knows because it is it, that the cost of reading and writing is roughly the same. And in fact, the cost to read and write is so much the same that it's also noticed that a sequential read and a, sequ and a random read, same cost. There is no advantage on an SSD because there's no moving parts to do sequential I.O. over random I.O. So based on that fact, your SSD does something rather smart. It has its own internal page table of sorts. It keeps track of which pages are free, which pages are in use, and which pages are garbage that we just haven't taken out yet. And when you decide you want to overwrite part of the file, this is what the SSD controller says. It says, ah, so I need a new page then. You know what? Instead of doing all this business of the naive solution, copying it into RAM, overwriting it, reading it back, you know what I'm going to do instead? I'm going to find a free page that's never been written to, or at least it's all initialized to once on the disk, and I'm going to make your file now use that region. So it was using block 52, or page 52, now it's using page 57. And so it's going to update everything in the file system to make sure that we know that we are now using page 57 instead of 52. And then it marks the old page 52 as garbage. Now obviously this is going to cause a little bit of a problem because eventually you're going to have so much garbage that you can't do anything. So periodically what the controller is going to have to do is take out the garbage. And that is it's actually going to have to reset all of those blocks that has been marked as garbage. Uh, that's trim, by the way. And when I got my first SSD, Windows did not support that feature. And so the naive solution was really the only way to do it. But uh, trim now is something that's very popular and lets us do that. Now, here's some other interesting facts about SSDs. So when you think of an SSD, you think of this 
impervious, amazing, never fails. It's got no moving parts, so if I drop it a hundred times, who cares? It'll last forever. Uh, no. Uh, I hate to tell you this, but they're not perfect. What's interesting is that you can only write to each of the cells a limited number of times. And if you're thinking that it's like a million or a billion, you're being very optimistic. Each page, the last I looked, can only be written to, or each block can only be written to about 100,000 times. And after that, applying the voltage will just not do anything. So what happens when one of the blocks becomes no longer writable? Well, the SSD controller will mark it internally as being read-only. Now, not every SSD controller is the same quality. Some SSD controllers, after a very small part of the disk has been marked as read-only, will mark the whole disk as read-only. And others will wait for a little bit longer. But at some point, when your disk becomes a certain percentage of blocks as read-only, the controller will mark the whole thing as read-only. Yeah? Why? Like, why not just keep using the rest of it? Um, so there's this kind of rule that exists that you should never let your disk get beyond, um, I think it's like two-thirds capacity. So if you are take, continuously taking away space from what's available and the person is still using it at the rate that they would normally use it at, then they would be going into territories which, you know, we can't even support that anymore. So the disk is just not behaving up to the performance that we are expecting. It becomes harder and harder to actually manage it as a whole. So you get to a rate where it just says, you know what, it'd be just easier if we got it in them. So it marks it as read only. Yeah. Now, one of the interesting issues is the fact that it's entirely possible for certain blocks of your disk to wear out before others. And the disk manufacturers don't want that to happen. Because what happens if Windows has written to like 10 blocks, like 8 billion times, they're now marked as read-only, but that's now the capacity, or that's at the percentage where the disk says that, mark the whole thing as read-only. But you've never touched the other cells. So to try to prevent uneven wear, they also do this thing called wear leveling. The idea is the SSD controller is on purpose scattering data to the wind such that all of the cells are going to wear down at the same time. So when you get to the rate of 65% of read-only, the others are very close. So we're going to get there anyways. Now, that means there's some interesting consequences with SSDs. There's this thing called defrag that I've mentioned. Defrag is used to take randomly uh, all the fragments of your file which are randomly dispersed across your disk to collect them back all together and make the files live sequentially on the disk. Do not run this on an SSD. Number one, there's no real advantage to doing so. Random I.O. and sequential I.O. are roughly the same cost. No performance advantage. Furthermore, the act of defrag is going to write a lot of stuff to your disk. So you are doing, and it's going to put it in a specific fixed location. So you are breaking the wear levelers' goals by running defrag. Do not do it. You will prematurely wear your SSD out if you do it. There's no advantage. Now, that being said, what you do get out of SSDs, you do get improved performance. There are no moving parts. There are no motors to talk about. Because there's no motors and no moving parts, they use less power, they generate less heat, and they have a much larger range of operating temperatures. So obviously they are where we want to go. But be it warned, they are not perfect. And another thing to be warned about is if that SSD controller dies, you are not recovering your data. And yes, I've had this happen. My first SSD was bought 10? Oh no, 13 years ago. And the company had a 35% failure rate. 
Yeah, that sucked. With a mechanical hard drive, even if the disk fails, the data is still technically on the platters, even if some of it is corrupted. You can take that disk to a forensic uh, computer person, and they can actually pay them to recover all the data. Most of the time, they can recover everything. If an SSD controller fails, you are out of luck, the data is gone, move on with your life. This is also, by the way, why uh, you see people dumpster diving at like government institutions, because governments don't always like realize the fact that you know you can't just toss. Oh, they'll just we'll just format it and toss it out and bin out back. Yeah, and most people don't know how to properly format. Uh, in order to truly or to mostly get the data off of those disks to scrub them clean, you have to overwrite them at least seven times for a mechanical drive. So yeah. If you want to make sure your data is still around, they're a little bit more stable in that sense. All right. Yep. Um, why, why is it that when the controller dies, you can't access the data anymore? Because part of the controller is that table that keeps track of which of the pages are in use by what files. And so if the controller dies, it's usually that table gets destroyed as well, which means that you can no longer find the data on the disk. Can't you read every single cell though and try to piece it together? It really depends on how the disk has died. There are ways that the disk can die that um, it actually loses power or partially loses power, like it loses that charge, in which case, nope, you're out of luck. Whereas you don't have to worry about that with a mechanical drive because it's being actually stored in like a physical media. Yeah? So if I'm like a big company like Google with like infinite money, would I like use hard, like hard drives for my backups and SSDs for my like actively used? Okay, so companies like, I can talk about this from Amazon actually's perspective. Okay. Um, so number one, most companies use magnetic tape for archives because it's cheap um, and it's a physical media. It's cheaper than desks. Uh, companies like Amazon, how they actually handle reliability with disks is by having duplicates. Um, there have been studies that show that you need at least three disks. Um, and so if you're, use, if you're paying for the upper tiers of Amazon S3, so they can have three copies of your data, like of three separate disks, um, in a single data center. But what you really want is three disks in three different data centers. So you have three in one data center, three in another data center, and three in a third data center. So how they actually usually handle it is by making extra, more and more and more and more and more copies of it. That's really the only way that you can be certain you don't lose it. Yeah. There's some great papers about that, by that way. It's fun stuff. All right, so one last kind of memory to talk about, which is fairly recent. Um, and this is called persistent RAM. So it goes by many names. Some people call it re-RAM for resistive RAM. Uh, Intel calls it Intel Optane. It's also known as 3D Xpoint. It has lots of different names. This is something that has fairly recently come onto the market, though it has existed for some time. It is effectively an SSD. The performance of it is roughly an SSD, but the hardware implementation of it is quite different. Um, and the sizes tend to be uh, a little bit different as well. So what this would be is, it is it's going to behave like RAM, and it's going to be used like RAM, but it is actually like a PCI card in your computer. And what it is used for specifically uh, is caches for your disk drive. So obviously you've seen how expensive it is to get data from a mechanical drive. Well, most companies are using mechanical drives because they're cheaper, larger storage units. Um, you can recover data from them if they die. So that's what they're using. But because of the cost of actually reading or writing data to it, they want to keep a very large in-memory cache of data blocks. So the idea is when you want to read something from the disk that maybe we've been accessing fairly frequently, instead of going to the disk every time, why don't we just have a copy of RAM? RAM is limited. So the idea behind the use of this persistent RAM, which is RAM that keeps, the, uh, keeps its values after the power is lost, um, is that we will use it as a disk 
block cache. So it is a cache, so it's operating very much like how we would use regular RAM, except now if the power goes out, when I turn the computer back on, that cache still exists. And so I, it's almost as if I didn't lose a step. So it's actually a pretty cool thing that's come to play. Is it something you're probably going to buy for your computer? Probably not, because its use cases aren't really for the consumer. This is really meant for companies like Amazon or the big companies that want to have the performance of uh, the performance improvement from that cache. So this thing has a much longer lifespan than software. They do have a longer lifespan as well. Yeah. All right. I'm going to call it quits there. That is the end of devices.